Again, you have been amazing all day. So just keep the energy up that you've had all day. Make our guests feel welcome. Cheer, whoop, explode if you need to, if you're that excited. You ready, Beck? Yeah. Please Give it up, welcome to the stage, James, James Master! Hey, beautiful people. Honestly, look how excited these people are. This is um, incredible. Hey, before we get started, can I ask a favor? You can ask whatever favor yes. you want. Okay, I, I like to take a little um, video of anyone who's doing cosplay uh, of any show that I've been in, and then I film them and put them on my social media. This is going to be fun. Yeah, the, uh, best, the best way is to do it completely unnaturally like that. Like that? Like you're about to oh, like, jagger it. I feel like God. <laughs> All right. Um, so I like to give them a, a, a big round of applause at the end of my little video on my Instagram, which is where you guys come in. Uh, can you like, when I say action, can you raise your hands and scream like your t team won the the cup or whatever you? Yeah, I don't yeah. play reindeer games. Good, so good sports reference. I'm, I'm not a sports. Uh, no, guys, you know what to I don't do. Play football. You're excitable. I do. You're martial happy. Arts. Like to be in the video as Why don't you no. applause? Like James Masters is on the stage. <laughs> yeah. I love how you just took direction with no effort, and also you all started to stop and then went, no, no. We'll go again. Absolute <laughs> professionals. We love you. Oh yeah. Welcome to Brussels. Um, first time? No, I think it's like my third time. Oh nice. I love Brussels. Yeah. Like Brussels, the people of Brussels, there's a lightness, there's a humor, there's a fun in Brussels, which I think comes from not being too arrogant. I was talking to be some people in line. And like, I'm from the US, so I know about arrogant people. <laughs> and it's really annoying, you know? And it really keeps, I think, people from being very happy very much. And in Brussels, people are just kind of, when I say humble, I mean kind of wise, in that if you don't take yourself too seriously, life can be fun. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, so like, I'm a goofball. I do not take myself seriously. Like, I'm an actor, so I am like basically a clown. A professional clown. So there's no reason to take myself seriously. So when I come to Brussels, I'm like, oh, I fit in here. Yeah. 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 Brussels by nature. What? Brussels by nature. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I guess you're kind of used to this level of reception now. Do you do a lot of cons? Do you do a lot of stuff? Yeah. I. It's. It sounds like I'm taking myself seriously, but yeah, yes, yeah. I'm used to it. <laughs> Actually, yeah, and, and now with the actor studio, I don't take myself seriously. <laughs> Cross legs. Yeah. No, I, um, it used to kind of uh, freak me out to oh, have really? this much attention. Yeah. Um, and then I realized that I was just really lucky to be part of a show that touched the nerve of the world. But yeah, not and just I a show, like a... A game-changing show. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. I yeah. Mean, but the thing is, I didn't make that show. I was what? in that show. Oh, so, I think we could argue you somewhat made the no, show. No, 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 no. I used to direct. I used to produce. I used to do that. And I did not do that on Buffy. I stood on tape. And I, and I said the lines that were written for me. I said them very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean that that's that's not the different that's not the same thing as making that show. Yeah. And so I'm just the way that I kind of deal with everyone being excited to see me is that I'm representing a show that I was really lucky to be on that was really well made. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean again though, like this sort of thing obviously when Buffy started was probably you would never have imagined like Oh, I knew. Do you knew? I Tell did, us. actually. How did yeah. you know? How did you I, know? I was a Star Trek fan. Like, I was coming to conventions when I was 13 years old, dressed as Spock. Right? And now and we I want had, photos. I had, like, I had, no, there are no photographs of that. No way. Because, like, I had the perfect tunic, I had my phaser, I had pointed ears, and a big blonde afro because I couldn't control my hair. But. 
Blonde Afro smoke. <laughs> it's a great, right? <laughs> great. Ultimate That's why there smoke. are no pictures of that. But like all the, there, I just remember being 13 years old, and all of these women wanted to talk with me because I had the coolest phaser at the at the yeah. the con. Yeah, yeah. So that's how they say, don't they? Yeah. It's not anything but having the coolest phaser. Oh, right. James yeah. Masters, what a great phaser. <laughs> that's what they say. So what were we talking about? Uh, <laughs> you knew. Oh yeah. So so like. I watched the. This is the OG Star Trek, like, because I'm old, right? This is like way before all the other Star Trek, and I watched those episodes 10, 15, 20 times. I watched them when I knew what the dialogue was. I watched them when I knew what the plot was going to be. But there was something about that world that I kept wanting to go back to, mm. even when I knew it was going to happen. And I think the reason for that is that Star Trek was selling hope. It was selling the idea that we might grow up as a species, we might actually start treating each other well, and we might survive ourselves. And that was that drew me back over and over again. And I remember thinking while we were filming Buffy that we might be creating a world that is, that is really delightful enough that people are gonna wanna go back to even when they know what's gonna happen. Yeah. And I remember, uh, it's like two o'clock in the morning. I love conventions. It's like a dinosaur for no reason. Just <laughs> that's a real dinosaur. Because you know, the, the so, they so it's like it's like late at night. It's like two o'clock in the morning, and I go up to the Buffy cast, and I'm like, guys, we may be talking about this scene for the rest of our lives. Does anyone want coffee? And they were like, shut up, James. We're tired. I'm like, all right. And what's they're the, like, I scene? told you so. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember what scene? No. No. <laughs> all of them. But I mean, that's the other thing with Buffy. Not just fans, like you knew the inside out of Star Trek. People know Buffy like the back of their hands. It's such a like, it became a studied show because you changed TV formulas and stuff like that. It became the model for all Netflix and everything like that. That sort of season arc with a creature of the week. Nothing like that existed in my memory until no. you guys came along. And that is incredible. That, that, yeah, yeah. It was it was one of the first shows to tell a long story arc as opposed to one individual, you know, yeah, encapsulated story for every episode. Yeah. But also at the same time, like completely reflecting youth culture of that era in a way that had never been seen before. And I think that's what the longevity is. Is yeah, you know, this is a, actually this is one of the secrets of the writing of Buffy. This is why it connects so well. Is because the writers were being asked to come up with their worst day, like the day that they don't talk about or the day that keeps them up at night when they really hurt somebody or when they really got hurt and then slap metaphorical fangs on top of that dark secret and tell the whole world. Oh, I so, love that. Yeah, it was an act of vulnerability and courage from some really good writers. And, it, and what it means is that Buffy is not a show that is telling people it's not a bunch of L.A. writers telling other people how to live their lives. It's just human beings saying, hey man, this sucked for me. Back when I was in college, this happened to me and this was horrible. Does anybody else, did, am I alone? Did, did anyone else go through something like that? Yeah. yeah. When, when you obviously found out, oh, so I'm, were you approached for the role or did you audition for it? At what point did you read the script and see this part and go, this is going to be... Part of something big. Because you, you were season two, am I right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. you sort of knew of the show before, or were you cold on it? Yeah. Kind of. Like, I came down to Los Angeles uh, about six months prior, and I had told my agent that I would take anything, that I was not proud. I didn't come down to Los Angeles to prove that I was a good actor. I already did that in theater. I didn't care about getting a little golden statue or something. I was here to feed my family because I, I had had a son and I was a theater actor and you don't make enough money to be a dad if you're in theater. And so I came down here to prostitute myself, I told them. And they, I was like, I'll be the new Alf. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I'll, be, I'll be Urkel. I don't care, I need money. And, and my agent was like, oh, I love you. You know, like, we're gonna make money. And so when they, th then they called me up and said, do you want to uh, audition for Buffy the Vampire Slayer? I was like, no, I saw the movie, horrible. <laughs> but then they said, they, they said, this is the television show, it's different, 
uh, and, and it's very good. Why don't you watch it? It's on tonight. Why don't you watch it and call us back? And I watched 15 minutes of it, and I called him back. I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Get yes. me on right now. Um, but apparently they had been uh, looking for a spike for like six months, and they hadn't found anybody, and they were three days away from shooting, and they had no one. So what? they apparently they scraped the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Seriously, like calling no, all the, calling I, everybody, and then they found me. Again, I know this yeah. is the same with all these types of shows, but that role is so yours. To think that anyone else should yeah. do that, that's that's. Did insane. you already have the the bleached hair, the the white? Oh no, they. Okay, they, they told me that they wanted the Sid Vicious of the Vampire set, yeah. right? <laughs> Sid, Sid Vicious was in the Sex Pistols, right? And I'm like a punk rocker. I'm like from the 70s, I saw the clash, like, oh, we destroyed what? the Cow Palace, man. We destroyed what? the Cow Palace when we saw the clash, we ripped it up. Um, so they said, we want Sid Vicious, I'm like, no you don't. And they're like, what? I'm like, no, you don't want Sid, here, I'll give you Sid, so you'll know that you don't want him. This is Sid Vicious. Girls like me because I've got a pretty face and beautiful figure. I said, <laughs> Sid was a moron, man. Like, Sid didn't play on the album. He ruined the tour. He broke the band. He was an idiot. You don't want Sid. You want Johnny Rotten. And they're like, yeah. they're like, for God's sake, we just want punk rock. I'm like, okay, fine. And so they, they spray painted my hair black because that's Johnny Rotten. It's also yeah. Sid Vicious. Uh, and it didn't look good. And at that point, the hairdresser was like, I'm so sorry, James. Um, there's only two colors in true punk rock. It's either jet black or bone white. Like, like purple and pink and blue, that's glam, and that it's not punk. So mm. we're going to have to bleach you, and we only have two days left, so we're going to bleach you one day and then bring you back and bleach you again. It's a long process, I can tell you that. Yeah. yeah. Right, so, so that... The, the first one hurt a little bit. The second one, the next day, that hurt bad. Right on the scalp. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. That was not fun. Yeah. Um, that suffered was a, for your art. What? You suffered for your art. I fucking well did, man. <laughs> yeah. I, um, yeah. The, the, we, we bleached it every eight days. Oh, what? wow. Yeah. So your hair was nice and soft? The hair was fine, but the scalp, man. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like dandruff if it peels. Oh, yeah, it yeah. just comes off in the comb, like. Yeah, it's like having a sunburn on your head. Yeah, yeah, but like on the bottle it says, only use this every six weeks. It is not safe to use more often than that. And I'm playing a vampire, and a vampire's hair does not grow because you're dead, so you can't have roots, so. <laughs> Every eight days, we were pouring bleach on top of the blisters from the last week's bleaching oh. for like nine months. At any point, are you like, oh, I should just got a wig? No. Are you man, just thinking, no. oh, I wish I was no. the new Alf? No, I look. <laughs> <laughs> I look good, man. I imagine, knew I look good. I'm imagine blonde birthday. Alf. Yeah, I'm a blonde Alf. That'd be amazing. Love, you love eating cats. Um, I love also. I'd love that you love punk rock before you took that role. So that, because like obviously that is such a part of that character. Yeah. So you were completely into it beforehand then? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Was that um, your, your scene? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Sex Pistols, Dead Kennedys, you know? Bondi, <sighs> but they sold out, but they're still good. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, yeah, all the OG stuff, man, Clash. Oh, amazing, again, yeah. but again, like, that character was so like. Like, okay, okay, so. I go, this is the Cow Palace story, so go, uh, go see the yeah, class. Yeah, I want to hear it. Go see the class, and we're drinking like, sorry, how many kids in the audience? Well, I was underage, I was it's drinking, fine. sorry. And <laughs> we, we are in Belgium. We get, okay, so, <laughs> they, so like. They, they are breastfed beer here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's true. It's We've seen true. it. <laughs> Punk rock. Okay, so, so I, sneak, I sneak a bottle of tequila in my booth. And you're not supposed to take any bottles or any glass. And they're searching people. And for some reason, I get away with it. And I'm, dr I'm drunk. And we go up into the mezzanine. And I remember, like, starting to fall asleep. And the dead Kennedys are warming up. And, and Jello Biafra is naked and bouncing around the stage. And I'm kind of, like, blearily kind of remembering this as if in a dream. And my friend goes, dude, give me your hand. And I put out my hand. He, he like, puts, like, all of these white pills in my hand. There were um, uh, caffeine pills called uh, Vivrin, 
And I took like 10 of them and slipped it and then passed out again. And then I remember this voice goes, and now the clash. And the whole place just erupts. And I wake up and all the caffeine comes into my system. And I'm like, what? Like that. And, and, and we're jamming. And I turn to my friend and I'm like, because like we're up in the mezzanine, but the, but the main floor, there's no seating. It's just people standing. And we're pogoing which is like the precursor to the mosh pit. Yeah. So in pogoing, you just basically you're jumping up and down, right? But half the audience is jumping this way and half the audience is jumping that way and down the middle is like a mosh pit and it's violent. And so I, I turn to my friend and I'm like, I'm gonna give my bottle to the band, man. And he's like, no, you're not, shut up. Sit down, James. Yeah, yeah, and you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going down the middle to get there. James, 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 stop, 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 stop. And I leap up. And I go right down the middle and I get pelted. I am like bloody by the time I get to the front <laughs> and I get within five and I take it out of my boot and I chuck it up on the stage and Joe Strummer is counting off. And he goes, one, two, three, what the fuck? You know? <laughs> Cause Joe thinks that they're about to get like a hundred bottles. Yeah, Cause yeah, in yeah. punk rock, sometimes they just start chucking bottles at you. In fact, the pistols often played in a cage so they wouldn't get killed. And so, his show was pissed off, but then he looks at his feet and it's a full bottle. And he's like, and there's no other bottles coming. He's, he's like, hey, all right. So he picks it up, takes a swig, and then throws it around the band, and they all take a swig. And he goes, who did that? And like little 17 year old, well, 16 year old Jimmy Marsters goes, me. <laughs> Just a spock. Yeah. And he goes, he goes, thanks, mate. And boom, goes into like, I don't know, one of the songs. And, um, and I think that I am the uh, best friend of the band. So I go backstage, and I make it that far backstage, <laughs> and two huge guys chuck me out into the rain. Wow. Best night of my life. Yeah. So what you're saying is, next Comic-Con, if anyone wants to talk to you, they should come up and put a full bottle <laughs> yeah. of booze. That's your life now, just tequila coming at you everywhere. Yeah. That's one of the coolest stories I've ever, yeah, that's ever really heard, cool. by the way. Yeah, yeah, Fucking yeah. Have you met a... Johnny Rotten since you did Spike at all? No, man, no. Yeah, I did wonder if, yeah, you ever had that crossover of, yeah. Johnny Lydon. What will he say? <laughs> oh, oh, right now, he's, he's, oh, you're, oh, you're that television vampire, aren't you? Well, yeah, yeah. he's selling butter in the UK at the moment, <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I don't you know. think he's had on such a high horse anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe we get along. What the yeah. hell? Yeah. Um, guys, we are going to open the floor to questions, because yeah. otherwise I'm going to talk about pun rock for about... 10 hours so yeah if you've got a question hand up and guys you can ask me anything that you want like try to embarrass me I dare you um, I don't know where Thomas is so I'm going to let you do the first question and I'll find out where the other mic is hang on I'm sorry I don't have an embarrassing question but my question is just what was your favorite part about Spike or uh, your favorite part about playing him my favorite part about playing Spike I swear to you between the words action and cut, I was in heaven every time. And between, as soon as I said cut, I had to come down to earth and it was always a bit of a letdown. Um, but I will say one of the sweetest things was slagging off Buffy or Angel. Like most of the other actors, like if you're playing a secondary role in any, any television show, most of your lines are, what do we do now, Buffy? Good job, Buffy. Everyone, follow Buffy. Oh dear, Buffy's not here. What do we do? You know, stuff like that, you know? And, and then it comes my turn. I'm like, oh, shut up, Buffy, you stupid. We're all gonna die. You know, <laughs> that's just a sweet place to be. <laughs> and then, then I fall in love with Buffy and I'm starting to say, oh, would you like a cup of tea, Buffy? Oh, sit here, Buffy. Would you like to sit in my lap, Buffy? Oh my God, you know? It was just not as quite as fun. And then I go over on Angel, and I'm like, oh, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ruin his day every day. So, yeah, it was kind of being that, it's being the side character, like a different kind of side character that doesn't have to be nice. Yeah. That's great. Thomas is in the crowd, so, yeah, we'll get round. Don't worry. Hi. Um, so, I wanted to ask you if you had a, a song in mind that could, that would define Spike as a, as a whole. Ooh. Like like a character theme Cause song. Cause I'm just a teenage dirtbag, baby. I'm just, if you think about it, her name is Noel Buffy. I had a dream about her, she rings my bell. I got gym class in half an hour, oh how she rocks. 
in kids and two socks and she doesn't know who I am okay and then Angel wait 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 that was really good her was boyfriend's good. a dick he brings a gun to school and he'd simply kick my ass if he knew the truth he lives on my block he drives and I walk and he doesn't know who I am and he doesn't give a damn about me Cause I'm just a teenage dirtbag, baby I'm just a teenage dirtbag, baby Listen to Iron Maiden, baby, with me Ooh. Yeah, oh, chills on the ears there, right? Well, I can't believe you all know that song. That's Everyone knows that song. Also, a two, 200 year teenage dirtbag as right? well. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, oh, we've got yeah, questions coming round. So, yeah. Hi, James. Uh, by the way, this is my wife, Kirsten. And Where she has a wrong? huge, huge crush on you, by the way. You're welcome. Anyway, uh, we just you... had a child. We have a baby boy. Congratulations. Thank you very yeah. much. And I was wondering, you mentioned that you have a child, a boy. Is he ever embarrassed of you? Not a... Okay, I'm gonna say yes, but if he was here, he'd be like, well, occasionally, yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, no, man. Uh, I've got a really good relationship with my son. Um, I, I remember uh, he and his mom, his mom, his mom and I got divorced when he was like a year and a half years old. And they moved back to Northern California and I was in Los Angeles doing Buffy and I decided I was gonna call him every day and talk with him every day and visit him every other weekend no matter what but when you're working up to 20 hours a day it got really tempting to say I'm too busy on set to call him He's, he can't even talk yet anyway or I'm too tired to go this weekend I'm not gonna do it and so I read this book by the Dalai Lama and I don't remember anything about the book except this one line and it said that all of our lives were preparing for the moment of death. So we should live our lives in a way that we don't have regret when we're dying. And that clarified everything because I, 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 I put the book down and I was like, you know, if I'm on my deathbed thinking about a television show, no matter how good it is, it's only going to be so good of a death, really. But if I'm on my deathbed and I'm thinking that my son knows that, he, that I love him, and he knows, I know that he loves me and we're good. That's the kind of death I want. So it clarified everything. Um, and I definitely talk with him every day. And I definitely visited him. And now he's in law school. He's 28 years old. And we talk almost every day on the phone. Amazing. What advice as well. And you said you were going to be serious. <laughs> Matt's actually expecting his first uh, in January. Dude. Uh, but I'm not going to speak to mine at all. You are going to be so tired. Uh, like I'm tired now. <laughs> you don't even know what tired is, dude. I'm sorry. Like, how many parents are in the audience? Yeah, there we are. Like, like I, I think that heroism is helping someone when it hurts me, or when I have to sacrifice or give something. Yeah. And most of my experience of heroism in real life has come from being a parent. And so, like, if you're a parent, you're a hero. Yeah. I, I don't take this the wrong way, but in that moment, I've just decided you're going to raise my child. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what impact uh, does having been part of such a show like Buffy, a staple in television history, have had on your life in, in, in general? Yeah, what impact has the show had on your life as a whole in general? I... It changed everything. Um, I was able to take care of my father for 10 years before he passed away. He had Parkinson's and, that, and, and, and then the money from Buffy helped me do that. It helped me raise my niece. Um, it changed the entire trajectory of my whole family. Um, it... it uh, it, it had me hiding from the world for a few years, you know, 
Like, like there was a, there, when I had the blonde hair, um, I could be outside for 10 seconds. Like if I was out in public, if I stopped on the sidewalk for more than 10 seconds, a crowd would start to form. And the longer I stayed with that crowd, the bigger it would get and the more dangerous it would get. And there were times when cops had to come and it got, it got really weird. Uh, and so I was, I was hiding from the world for a while, and that was pretty weird. <laughs> um, I don't know how to say it. I, I, uh, it changed everything. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Good answer. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Absolutely great. Yeah. We got someone down here. Uh, first of all, I really like your music, and uh, what's your favorite scene uh, in Buffy? My favorite scene is actually on Angel when I kicked his ass on his own show. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the stroppy one. My favorite scene in Buffy is the final one, um, where Buffy says, I love you, and he says, no, you don't, but thanks for saying it. Because to me, and this may not be how you take it, but how I took it was that Spike is saying, Buffy, you can't love me. You're too good for me. You are above me, actually, because I'm, I finally have gotten a soul, and I can see clearly what kind of person I had become. I was horrible. I was killing innocent people all the time. I'm, I'm a fallen person. And I think that that's the first time you see that he's self-aware, that he's, he, there is actually the potential for him to actually grow up. And I always thought, after that scene, I was like, okay, there's hope. So I think that he's going to go out into the world and he's going to figure out what to do with this new soul of his. And as soon as he feels like he deserves her, he's definitely coming back for her. And they're definitely going to end up together. And then I read the comic books, so I was like, I'm right! But that was my favorite scene. Amazing. I'm really sorry. We've just been told we have to wrap up because we have to let you back at the convention. Yeah. Are you kidding? No, but we'll get a week. We all right, these guys, you guys are fabulous, man. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, you are. Oh, yeah. It's been an absolute oh. pleasure. Um, we get a, a photo with every guest, uh, and these guys all get in the background, so... Come over here. Everyone, do you know what to do? This has been an absolute pleasure, and I think these guys will make the appropriate noise to show you how much we appreciate it. He is here all weekend. Please do.